All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for stopping by and joining us on our uh, workshop this morning on quizzes. So the entire conversation today is going to be about Canvas quizzes. And I wanted to start today by, by really focusing on the basic structure and the process for us to create a quiz. And I'm going to go ahead and just start my screen sharing here and jump right into Canvas so that we get a uh, all of our, so we have a big chunk of time at the end to answer questions. Because so I recognize pretty directly that that is likely the best way to go about this. Okay, so hopefully, and I just shared the wrong window. Let's try that again. Here we go. Hopefully everyone can see Canvas. Yeah, I think so. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So I'm just working in a Canvas, cor Canvas course called Pat's Playground. And there's really nothing special about this. This is the default Canvas configuration that you see across all of CRC. And for a quiz, there's a couple different things that you want to take in mind when working with a quiz, okay? And really it's where the quiz information truly lives. Now when working with quizzes, the quiz item can end up in two different places at the exact same time. But the root, the true starting point for a quiz is gonna be in our quizzes tool. So I'm over here inside of my course nav bar and let me find it. It's way down here at the bottom on my Canvas course, right here, quizzes. And if we click on this quizzes tool, this is gonna show us a library of quizzes that we've created inside of Canvas. Before we go any further, I want you to note very directly here that for my students, I turn the visibility of this library off. And I'll come back to that here in a minute. Now, some of you guys are probably wondering why is it off, but we can still access it. As instructors, we get access to everything. We, there's no secret to us inside of Canvas. So this quizzes tool gives us access to a library, and then we can place those quizzes in very specific modules inside of our Canvas course. So here's the library of quizzes that I've, that I've created for, uh, for this particular Canvas course. And you can see that we can organize them into a whole series of groups as well. So if you have a whole series of surveys, we can create some very simple groups. Um, and we do that in the plus quizzes area. I'll come back to this over here. Um, so we got practice quizzes, assignment quizzes, library just think globally these are these are items that can be placed inside of any instructional module in your course itself let's go ahead and start the process of creating a quiz it's pretty easy of course like most things in canvas we're going to start in the upper right hand corner and select this quiz button now you're going to have some options here and on the surface this is going to seem pretty intimidating we're going to be exploring this new quizzes structure over the course of the spring semester. So we have two different systems. We have classic quizzes, and then we have new quizzes. Of course, the name here kind of gives it all away. This is a new quiz architecture and a new structure that Canvas is going to be implementing next July. So in July of 21, we're not going to have two architectures. We're just going to have what you see here in the new quizzes area. I'm going to encourage you to explore this. There's a lot of learning resources out there online that talks very directly about how we can implement and use the new quizzes architecture inside of Canvas. We're going to focus our entire, the entirety of our conversation today on the classic quizzes. And this is what we've been used to seeing well, since we adopted Canvas since 2017. So I'm going to create a new classic quiz. All right. And this is going to take us to the traditional rich content editor. And the great thing about working with quizzes inside of Canvas is that it's not too different from authoring a Canvas page or Canvas assignment. There's a lot of crossover with, with how all of this is put together. And it's going and it's accessing that, that crossover here inside the quizzes area. So, of course, we need to make sure that we provide some details. Now, a lot of these details and these properties are gonna be properties that only you as the instructor are going to edit and change. Think of them very similarly to how we change the properties of our assignments inside of Canvas. Let's give it a good name since we're approaching midterms. Let's call this midterm exam. I apologize. I know many of you guys wanna have, uh, you guys wanna have. Um... Pat, can I um, yes, please do. interrupt? 
um, I don't seem to see what you are pointing at. I only see assignments and your screen has not changed. Oh. So. Okay, let me stop. I don't know. This is a problem what's... on my side. I apologize. Thank you for interrupting. Okay, let me see what's going on. I, I think someone else was having a problem as yes. well. You're pointing in an open space. Thank you. Um, let's see. So every time you were pointing at quizzes and your library, I couldn't see any of that. I am so sorry. This is this is entirely my fault. I was sharing. I thought I was sharing the correct. I want to share just everything on my desktop, just to make it easy. Okay. So now, okay. Can you guys see Canvas? Yes. My cursor. We're good now. Cool. I apologize. Let, well, let's go back then a little bit. Thank you for uh, for bringing that to my attention. I'm going to pop my chat window out. That way I can see when these questions appear. I'm working off of two computer screens as most mm -hmm. of us are at the moment. So I'll try to manage the chat as best I can. Luckily, there's only a couple of us here today. So if you have a question like Celia did, just jump right in. I'm, I'm, I don't have any ego and stuff like this, right? So just interrupt me. It's all good. <laughs> all right. With that said, let me back up for a second and show you uh, where we can find all of these quizzes and this quizzes tool. So it's in your course nav bar and it's this object right here. Okay. And as I mentioned before, this is a library of all of the quizzes inside of our canvas course itself. Right. And each of these quizzes can then be placed in a specific module. So the quizzes tool, I often don't make it visible to my students. As you can see down here, it's invisible at the moment. That way I can manage the library and I get to determine in which instructional module these quizzes are going to be placed. I try to make the modules tool in Canvas the central hub for every single thing that I do. I'm a big believer of the hub and spoke mentality when it comes to course design. So having one centralized location for all of this information for all of our learning materials and assessments makes it really easy for our students to understand um, what's expected of them and where they need to go continuously throughout the course of the, uh, of the semester to get, their, to get access to their learning materials and assessments. So the quizzes tool is our library. I'm going to create a quiz and then place this quiz in a module here in a minute. So let's go ahead and start creating a quiz. I'm going to use this class, classic quizzes structure. New quizzes is coming in next year, next summer. Okay. And of course, we're going to start off by giving it a good name. Now, I got to apologize. Um, I wish that I could call this something other than a quiz. The only place that we'll be able to customize the name of our quiz is in this details tab. It's always, even if I put midterm exam on here, Canvas is still going to recognize this item as a quiz. Okay, so I apologize. I apologize. That's a limitation of the technology itself. Okay, so here's my midterm exam. This, this section in here, this is where we're going to write generalized directions for our quiz itself. So think of this as an area uh, where we get to directly communicate to the, to the student before we take the quiz itself. In a face-to-face, in in-person -face, in uh, quiz, quiz environment or exam environment, this would be the, you know, the five minutes of conversation that you'd have before we say, okay, quizzes started, right? So think about general directions, expectations, um, any limitations on the quiz that you want to make sure they're communicated to the students themselves. So this is our opportunity to write some instructions. And I'll just put some instructions. If you are providing uh, this quiz over many, many days, um, which is a good practice for online quizzes, you may want to reinforce that timeline in this instruction area over here. So these are generalized instructions. Now, the stuff down below, this is kind of like the nuts and bolts of the quiz area itself. And I want to draw your attention to this quiz type because a lot of folks kind of gloss over this. This is pretty neat because we actually have a couple different options in here. We have a practice quiz, a graded quiz, a graded survey, and an ungraded survey. So not, not, we can use this quiz structure uh, to play a couple different roles inside, the, inside of the larger context of our classroom itself. 
Um, I like this ungraded survey. You see me, I, you know, if you've taken the OTI bootcamp or the online teaching institute, we use these ungraded surveys all the time to get some really great feedback from our students. So uh, the practice quiz is another great item that a lot of folks uh, kind of forget that's here inside of Canvas. So this is going to be an ungraded quiz. It's not going to show up in their gradebook, but it still gives them an opportunity to practice taking a quiz inside of Canvas in a low stakes or no stakes way inside of our course itself. So this is, so you have some options here, which are pretty great. Okay, so here are the assignment groups that we can put this quiz into. This is referencing the assignment groups that hang out in uh, the assignment tool. Here it is, this thing. I'm not gonna travel over there at the moment, uh, but you know, if you wanna add a specialized category, because that's really what assignment groups are, you do that in the assignments tool. Okay, so more nuts and bolts stuff down here. You can shuffle the answers, which is pretty great. You can put a time limit, some folks like having this. Um, this section in here, definitely take a look at, because this will allow us to determine when the students will get access to the answers, the correct answers to the quiz, and for, how, and for how long. If you want your students to see the answers at a very specific date, definitely take a look at this, okay? Um, especially this one right here. Um, last semester, I had a, a number of professors ask me, hey, I'm doing like three different sections. I'm providing a midterm for uh, three different sections of my class. These sections meet at different times during the week. Can I, can I release the answers to this quiz for all of those sections like a week later? And the answer is, to that question is, yeah, absolutely, right here. So take a look at this. If you wanna manage when they see the answers, this is where you go. Okay. Um, Require access code, you don't need to do this. I've never done this for a quiz. That requires, especially filter IP address. If you have some, you need to be a, a computer hacker to really uh, to, to really cheat on a quiz that's got all this stuff going. Most of our students are not going to have that level of sophistication when it comes to computer science to be able to hack the IP address and hack the code if there is one to get into the quiz, but you can lock it down if, if you'd like. Um, in addition, we can also enable Proctorio. This is where we do it. Proctorio is an online proctoring service for all of our, that you can employ for all of the questions on, on this exam. There are some benefits and some problems with Proctorio. It only works with Chrome, for example, and you need to have a camera. Uh, um, not, every, not every student is gonna have a camera on their laptop or on their mobile device or on their computer. Um, not every not every student is going to be using Chrome for um, uh, for their as their primary internet browser. There is an extension, a Chrome extension that one needs to download in order to use Proctorio. So there are some barriers to the Proctorio system that can be challenges for our students to overcome. But if this is something that you're interested interested in, uh, there is a really great resource that we've created on our support website. Uh, that will help you. That will help you out. And I'll, 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 I'll circle back and post that resource in the chat as we draw to the conclusion of our little talk today. Okay. Other things in the nuts and bolts area. This is the assigned to. This is when the quiz is due. And of course, this is the window of opportunity for our students to take the quiz itself. So you can provide them with a very small window or a very large window. In our online classes, it's not uncommon for our instructors to provide a day or two for our students to uh, successfully complete this exam. Um, so remember, this is the due date when it absolutely needs to be finished. And this is the window of opportunity for a student to take that exam. One thing about this window of opportunity, make sure that you're not overriding and or having the time limit be a negative impact on that window. If you say it's gonna be a 60 minute exam, but only provide them with 59 minutes down here to take that exam, that may be a problem. Usually I kind of give like a 10 minute buffer at the end of the window, just to make sure that everyone has had an opportunity to hit that final submit button at the conclusion of their exam. Okay, any questions on the kind of the nuts and bolt back end kind of assignment level or the instructor level properties of setting up a quiz?
Oh, I have a question about the um, time frame that you're just discussing. So if you give them 60 minutes, but you give them two days to do it, they still just have the 60 minutes to do it in that time frame, right? You got it. You got really it. want to lock them into getting it done um, in, in terms of a, a availability. You want to give them enough time to find a, the right moment to sit down and take it, right? Bingo. And then you got it. Probably, you know, if you don't want students sharing questions or even if you're shuffling questions, um, maybe you want to keep that also that window fairly narrow. What do you recommend? Um, yeah, it's in. I embrace the idea that um, that our students are sitting in front of the most an entire world's worth of information, right? The internet provides us access to everything, right? Um, there's not a question in probably any of our courses that we can't find online within a couple mouse clicks and a couple keystrokes, right? So I kind of embrace the idea that um, our students, that all of our exams are open book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. um, so, and I think you hit the nail right on the head. You know, this, this window of opportunity is really, is really allowing our students to find the best opportunity within inside of their own personal lives to take the exam and to answer the questions on the quiz. If you're really concerned about cheating and the integrity of your quiz, as we all should, right? Because this is a legitimate concern. Um, there are things that we can do with the shuffling the answers, for example. I'm going to show you a way here in a minute to create what's called a question bank, which will allow us to randomize the questions and the answers. So in the big picture, everyone's uh, quiz is going to be different. All the questions are going to appear differently. All the answers are going to appear differently. If we set up our question banks in, in a way, um, we can also ensure that our students are not getting the same questions. It's not like they're just in a different order. They're just fundamentally getting different questions. Um, so when we add that layer of almost kind of randomness into the quiz itself, we increase the integrity without having to put a really big restrictive layer inside of the quiz experience. So when it comes to a recommendation for a window, I think every class is going to be different. The length of the quiz, the, the role of the quiz or the exam in this assessment moment is really going to determine that. Um, some folks like having, it's like they give their students a week. Some folks say, you, you only have four hours within this little section here to take the quiz itself. Couple things though, if you have an asynchronous class, right? So if you're not requiring your students to meet at a scheduled time during the week, you cannot require them to take the quiz synchronously together during a scheduled time. You have to provide them with a pretty, with a pretty big window. A few days would be, I think, a pretty appropriate. Um, I had some questions earlier in the semester. It's like, well, I'm teaching asynchronously. Can I require everyone to show up at 10 and then run the exam to 11? No, unfortunately you can't. That was not an expectation of the student when they first enrolled in the class. So we need to continue to provide them with asynchronous opportunities to complete the assessment for our course. But if it's synchronous, you could do that. Absolutely. Yeah. If you have a synchronous class meeting from, you know, Monday from 11 to 12, you could have your, your exam be open from Monday from 11 to 12. That's fine. Is there a way of turning the questions of the quiz off during the non-window period, like all the rest of the term? Uh, no. Okay. No. The only way to turn the questions of the quiz off would be to unpublish the quiz, and you can't unpublish a quiz after a student has taken it. So they're always going to get access to the questions and the answers uh, throughout the entirety of, of their, or for the remainder of the semester. And it really speaks to the purpose of, um, the purpose of these, these exams. Remember, these are learning moments. The questions are often learning resources. Um, so it's nice that our system allows them to go back in and review the questions and see their answers and hopefully the correct answers um, at a later point in the semesters, semester as well. One issue with that is that all the questions go online right away. Yeah. What we're finding. Yeah. That, chemistry. Yeah. That, well, that's a huge problem. It's it's um, 
in your, if you were doing this exam face to face, would you collect all the questions at the conclusion of the exam? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I have a review period afterwards after exam. Right. But if, if it says show correct, uh, oh, so if it's available from this point to that point, they're not going to see the questions in advance, right? If you make it yeah, available. They'll never see the questions in advance. Right. right. They'll see it after you've published it and it's available. And then you can choose not to give the answers until you've gotten, you know, a week has gone by and everybody's taken it, right? That's correct. And I think Mark's question was directed towards the questions. Can we remove the questions after the exam has been administered? Hmm. Um, and unfortunately, with Canvas, you can't. That's just a, a limitation of the technology. To be, okay. to be, to be, you can't really be fair with asynchronous then, because once one student gets the quiz, that will become available to the whole class, right? Yeah, and the way Canvas has designed their technology is that once a student has submitted their quiz, they're going to get access to that quiz for the remainder of the course. But the other students will have access as well. Is that correct? That's correct. Anyone that submits a quiz, they're going to, they're going to be able to see I know, that, but, the results but, of that quiz at any point. One student will, all the students in class will see anybody's uh, questions for any quiz. No, just, just, just theirs. Just theirs. Oh, just theirs. Yeah. Oh, okay. Just theirs. Absolutely. Yeah. All the all the student information is is private and protected. A student is only ever going to see their quiz information. They're not going to see how someone else did, or what their questions were. All right. Good questions. Good questions. Okay. Let's keep cruising on. So this is kind of like the nuts and bolts area of creating a quiz down here. Let's go into the the process of physically creating quiz questions. And that happens at the top here in this questions tab. Here we go. And this is where we begin the process of physically crafting the questions for our quiz. As you can see, since this is a new quiz, I don't have a single question in here. And we begin the process of creating our quiz questions with this new question button. Now, this is where um, it, it, we kind of open up Pandora's box for a little bit. And you as the quiz creator, I would encourage you to spend some time experimenting and exploring all the different choices that we have in this crazy pull down list. Cause we have a lot of options in here. We don't have to be just do multiple choice, true and false. I mean, we can write essays. You can have, you know, multiple drop downs. You can get pretty fancy, which is, which is quite, which is quite cool. The only one that I want you to be mindful of is this text. No question. This isn't, this is um, kind of like just filler text. It's a spacer. It's another way for you to maybe write a direction or maybe write a couple sentences that provide some sort of context to the, the following questions inside the quiz. This is not a, this is an, a non graded item inside of our quiz architecture. If you want your students to write something, definitely do like essay question. Most of the question types in this list are automatically going to be graded by Canvas, except the ones where they have to write something in by hand, an essay question. I think the formula and the numerical answer questions are areas where they can physically type in an answer instead of choosing an answer from a whole series of options or a pull down menu. Um, any question type that requires hand entry is almost always going to require some sort of hand grading at the end. So you'll need to revisit this quiz in speed grader to hand grade some of these question types. So, now, one of the things that I've learned from, from administering uh, quizzes in Canvas, um, especially when you're not using a question bank, is to provide some sort of reference point as to what this question is inside of a huge list. Simply having like a number one in here goes a long, long way. <laughs> um, or having some sort of title that's a, that will help our students understand the purpose of this question is helpful. Um, so like, like famous, oh, I don't know, uh, favorite movie. There we go, we'll do that one. Favorite movie, okay, and the question was, um, what is Professor Pass 
favorite movie? Okay, so that's the question. Might help if I spelled it right. There we go. So I'm just going to do a multiple choice question on this one. The rich content editor will allow me to put anything that I want in here. Be careful with pictures. Be careful with pictures. Um, if you, I need to take a step back because I forgot this very important point. The quiz experience is, a, is only officially supported by our desktop browsers. So if you have students that are uh, attempting to take a quiz on their mobile device through the Canvas app or even through the mobile web browser on their smartphone phone or tablet, they, are, they may run into problem. And the pictures, um, if they're not a JPEG, they may not show up on those mobile devices because mo some mobile devices and some operating system only support JPEGs. So this is a, a sticky a sticky element. Some pictures don't show up, so be careful with that. Um, you can use the, the rest of the rich content editor with ease to create your questions. Just be mindful of the role of pictures instead of your, I'm not saying don't use them, just test them and be very sure that everything is working before you put them in front of a student. Okay. Question on that. Um, yeah. If you type out your questions and then take a image picture of it and then put the image into your quiz to ask the question, that would prevent the students from copying and pasting into um, online uh, for, uh, for Google searching and stuff. It, would that be a way of doing that? No, and you don't want to do that because you have the for any picture that we put. Um, any picture that we put online, you're gonna have to provide an alt text, right? Um, you're making it very inaccessible for our students that are non sighted to access the content of those pictures. The only so if you have like a huge long question that has a whole bunch of numerical symbols and stuff in it, and, and if that question was in a picture, all of that instruction, all of that quiz question information would then have to be copied and pasted into the alt text for that image which is doable, but if you're using like mathematical formulas and a lot of really complex language, that's going to be a huge barrier for our students that are interacting with this quiz um, uh, with a screen reader. Can you show us how to put the alt text on the image here if we were to put in a picture? A um, yeah, absolutely. So, if we were to put, I just got to make sure I have a picture. Let's go into, um, it's right here, by the way. It's just right here. That's the alt text. You upload oh, it right where you upload the image. Okay. You got it. Yep. I don't recall seeing that, but okay. Okay. Uh, also, please, please, please notice that I'm using the new rich content editor, uh, which is now the default rich content editor, or will be the default here very, very, very shortly. Um, I think starting in January, this is going to be our exclusive environment for authoring all of our Canvas documents. Um, so if you haven't turned it on in your course, it's in your course settings. It's called Enhanced RCE. I definitely suggest that you turn it on, get used to working with it, because it's going to be the new normal starting January 1st. Or I think January 16th, I apologize. Okay. So um, here's the question down I'm below. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Where was that found again to turn on? Ah, yes, it is in your course settings. I can't travel away from it because okay. I lose all the yep. work. Then. Okay, I just yep. missed it. Course settings. Yep. And it's in the features tab at the top of that page. Great, thank you. All right, so I got my question. Down below the question, we have an opportunity to tell the computer what the correct answer is and then what maybe all the wrong answers are. So my favorite movie is, of course, Star Wars. But maybe the possible answers is Star Trek. And then the last one will be, I don't know. Pretty and pink. Pretty and pink. All right. I love it. Yes. <laughs> Although that is a very good movie as well. <laughs> That's know. Audrey Hepburn, right? From Every Quickly? No, it's... Um... Oh, what's her name? I forgot. Wait, is this the one from the 80s? This is an 80s. 80s. Yeah. Um, I can see the actress's face. I can't see yes, it. Yes, really short red hair. Yes, okay. I'm on the same page. Yes. I know exactly okay. the movie you're talking about now. Okay. Anywho. <laughs> 
So this, whatever is the green one here is gonna be the correct answer. Notice how these are all red, okay? These are the wrong answers. This is the correct answer. If we wanted to change the correct answer to be pretty in pink, like maybe we just forgot or we didn't see that, the, that one's green and the rest are red. If you just click on this arrow, notice how now this one is now green and pretty in pink would be the correct answer for this field. Larger point being, wherever this big arrow shows up and whichever one is green, that's the correct answer that the computer is going to choose when auto grading this assignment. Okay, let's go back to Star Wars here. The last thing that you wanna do is you wanna hit update question. That way it saves all of these changes. So I'll hit update question. And there we go. We've made our first question, which is pretty cool. Molly Ringwald. Molly, yes, Molly <laughs> Ringwald, thank you. Sorry, it, it no, was gonna bother okay. me. Uh, all right, so now that we have a quiz and then an area for, or excuse me, a question within inside of that quiz, let's save it. And the last thing that we need to do is that we need to pre-flight it. Now you're gonna go in and you're likely gonna add a whole series of questions into, into this exam itself. It does take some time. If you're writing an exam by hand, it takes some time. Lean into the idea that it's gonna take a couple hours to write a 50 question exam. Because think about it, you know, the thing that I, that I always struggle with is generating all of the wrong answers. That's the part for me that takes the longest. The question and the answer to that question for us as the instructor is relatively easy to, to draw focus to, but then having to go in and write all the wrong answers can be a little bit of a time consuming process. The last thing that you want to do when you're going through the quiz creation process is of course previewing the exam. We need to preview the entire student experience we can actually take the exam with all the parameters that we've set inside uh, of our quiz parameter or quiz options. Here we go. Let's just do Star Wars and then I'll submit the exam itself. I really recommend that you do this at least once. Please don't assume that the computer is correct. <laughs> assume that you or the computer have messed up at some point in the creation of this quiz and be an advocate for your student and take your quiz before you administer it to your quiz. I always find a problem, something that I missed when I created the quiz when I'm previewing it. So it, it's, it's generally speaking, the last thing that we wanna do <laughs> <laughs> especially after we have spent two hours making a quiz. Uh, but there's always going to be a problem that you didn't see or they didn't expect to create when you were creating the exam and pre-flight it. Is, so, is there a way to make changes after the exam is in progress and students are taking it? Kinda, you, get, you yeah. can, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of the preview. I'm going to submit the quiz, which will pop me back out. You can make edits, right? You can change the question types um, during an exam. You know, I don't think I would encourage you to do that. Um, depending on the type of change, if it's a typo, if you, you know, you put a period instead of a comma or you didn't, you know, didn't capitalize something or you maybe used the, you know, a small little inconsequential error I think you can make the change during the exam and it wouldn't be a problem. However, if you really messed up um, and all the students are, you know, if you marked the wrong one as, as correct, you, you know, I don't know. It, it, it depends on what the, what the, what the correction is. Any change that you make, you may want to make sure that this option at the bottom here is turned on. Notify users that this quiz has changed because we want to make sure that we're providing an opportunity for those students that have completed the exam to be aware that the exam that they took is now different, right? And uh, you- they want, If I wanted to manually change the point values of the quiz after the fact, um, I know I was having a problem with that where I change it and it would register it and the speed grading would give me the option of manually putting it in. So I literally had to manually grade everything outside and then and manually enter all the quiz okay. words in the grade sheet. But, yeah. if, but is there a way around that? How, how do I change the point values of things? 
think if I remember correctly, the way to go around it, um, there's at the bottom of speed grader, let's just take a look. There's a fudge, some fudge points, I think if I remember correctly. Um, let's hit save. This is actually a great segue into how we continue to manage these exams. So, oh, mine's not published, so let me just go ahead and publish it. Once the quiz has been published and students have taken the exam, you want to go back into the exam and visit these areas over here, because this is where we can start going into SpeedGrader and manually assessing and grading things. If I jump into SpeedGrader here, uh, I didn't submit this exam in, in student view, but this is where we can go in and see their scores. We can see every single question, as does the student. They can see all the questions that they were asked. Um, you will get to see the answers all the time. Depending on your quiz settings, you may have it set up to, to filter their, the visibility of, of the questions at, a, at the, or filter the visibility of the answers at a specific date. But all that information will show up here. I'm going to guess that when it comes to the quiz, I've never had to physically change the point value of a quiz after someone has taken it. Um, usually down here at the bottom, they'll say fudge points, which will allow you to kind of fudge the scores a little bit to get, to get what you want. Um, I, could, I could understand how the technology would not support changing the point value of a question after it's been answered, because a student may be choosing to, the student may have chosen to answer or not answer that question based on the point value. For example, one of the common quiz kind of tips, and I remember someone teaching me this, was if, if you have 10 questions, uh, you know, find all the easy ones first. Some points are better than no points, right? If, if all the easy ones are worth one point, go ahead and knock out the easy ones real quickly. Um, then you'll have more time to spend on the harder questions, right? Well, if you're making that decision based off of the point value of the question itself, it's, I think, maybe a little inappropriate to go back in and change those point values after a student has taken them. Because they may uh, have- No, I, I would I agree with that. Um, yeah. The problem was that um, I did put images in one quiz and I found out after the fact some students couldn't see the quiz. So I right. made that question work zero points. And, but I, I couldn't impose that manually with uh, yeah. the grader or anything. Yeah. Did, did, were you able to see that those fudge points at the bottom? Uh, well, I wanted to turn off that question for the whole class. Mm -hmm. I announced it to the whole class yeah. for the quiz. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, and I don't think I've ever been in a situation where I've needed to subtract points <laughs> from a quiz from a student. Um, it's always been I've had to add points in. So I don't know like if the fudge point will be will allow you to subtract, you know? It seems like you only find out about these life and death things during the quiz or afterwards. Okay, thank you. Um, one other thing. So speed grader is going to become a really important point in the final assessment of this quiz, especially if you have um, questions that need to be hand graded. You're going to come to speed grader to do all of that hand grading. One other thing that I want to draw your attention to uh, I'm back in the, the actual quiz itself. On the right-hand column here, we also have moderate this quiz. And this is particularly helpful because then you get to see specifically all of the students in your class, um, how many attempts they've had. They've, they've, you know, they've, they've attempted the quiz a number of times, how long they took the quiz, what their score is, okay? So this is a great way to see kind of a macro view of the performance of a specific student on a quiz. Um, in addition, this is also a super important place to go if you need to provide additional accommodations for a student. If a student needs more time on a quiz, some students need to have one and a half or two times the required or the allowed uh, length of a quiz, um, or multiple attempts, this little pencil icon right here will allow you to go in and on a per user or per student basis, add additional attempts and additional times. For example, everyone gets 60 minutes. Well, if I have a student that has an accommodation that requires twice the amount of time, I'm going to give them an additional 60 minutes. 
So whatever number you put in here is on top of, is in addition to what everyone gets. Same with the attempts. If everyone gets one attempt and the student gets two attempts, I'd put one, okay? So these are additions to whatever is in here. And then you hit save. This is an easy way of going in and uh, customizing the quiz experience on a per student basis. Because we have a lot of students that require extra attempts and extra time. Now, um, any questions on that? Okay, I'm running out of time here. Um, I want to, I'm gonna stop sharing just for one second and I wanna copy and paste some resources inside of our chat so that you have some additional information on how to work with quizzes. And I apologize for one second, I'm just gonna pull this information up. Especially if you want additional information on working with Proctorio. We've created an, uh, a wonderful website. This is the online education support website. And actually here, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna go to the CRC webpage here real fast. And I'll show you specifically where you can access it. Okay. All right, so this is the CRC webpage, um, CRC main website. If we go to the employee section here, we now have under uh, our campus services drop down menu, a page just for us in the distance education world. And I'm trying to make this page a centralized hub of, of all of our DE stuff, right? Of course, here's our drop-in schedule, which is pretty great. Um, here's the loop, uh, Zoom link to our drop-in schedule. They've even given us our own filter now in the master calendar, which is like, yay, I'm so happy about. Now we can filter by DE classes, which I'm super stoked about. But most importantly, given the context of what we're talking about, this online education support resources website is just chocked full of really great stuff that will help you craft some really engaging assessments and continue to craft uh, your quizzes. Specifically, you can get access to it down here, by the way. It's under the assessments area. At the top of this web page, there's also the nav bar. If you go to the assessments menu, man, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here including some really great strategies on how to create online assessments. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of academic research on, uh, on, on strategies, best practices for online exams, because how we administer an online exam or an online quiz is different than the way we would do it in person. So these are some really great suggestions for, or for, for online exams. If you want to learn more about working with Proctorio and maintaining your academic integrity, this is a great place to get some additional information. There's some deep dives on Proctorio in here, which I would encourage you to go take a look at. And then building exams in Canvas. This page um, is kind of more nuts and bolts stuff, you know, kind of the basics, kind of a lot of what I've talked about today. So you have some great information at your fingertips that I would encourage you to go check out inside the online education support resources website. One other thing that I would encourage you to, to go take a look at, and I don't think it's in here. However, if you were to go to, if you go to YouTube and do a search for this week in Canvas, I posted a video. Let's see, here we go. This week in Canvas. Oops, I'm seeing me and I'm hearing me in two different spots. There we go, I'll pause the video. Okay, um, I posted a really great video last semester about using question banks. It's this one right here. Question banks inside of Canvas. Check this out. If you're an advanced Canvas user and you wanna truly create a randomized quiz experience, question banks are the way to do it. It takes a little bit of setup. Um, but the power of question banks is pretty fantastic. So I definitely encourage you to go check out uh, this as well. Now, with that said, are there any questions? I, I had a question. So if, if you um, are creating your exam, uh, quiz the way you mentioned, can you then take those questions and create a bank out of them? Or do you have to start with the question bank? first? Yeah, you have to start with the question bank. Um, yeah, gotta start with the question bank. You can copy and paste all that stuff, but mm -hmm. you, you almost have to reconstitute. Actually, I take that back. I think there is a, there is kind of a, a workaround 
that requires you exporting your quiz quest, exporting your qu your quiz, and then re-importing just the questions to those quiz into a question bank. But it's kind of a it's kind of a gnarly workaround. Yeah. So if you're doing a midterm and you may want to use some of those questions on your final, it's best to create a question bank. I'm big believer in that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a question. Um, what if a student is unable to take the exam during that window? Um, how can we reset the exam after the due date? Can we? Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Let's jump back over into Canvas. I'll show you specifically where we need to go to do that. Um, one second, please. Because you know nowadays uh, lots of things can, can go on and it's happened Absolutely. already with assignments. And I think the generalized feeling here is that we want to try to be as flexible as we can. There's going to be a lot of these types of scenarios happening this semester and next semester. We're all working and living in this really weird upside down new normal. Um, so as m if we can provide as much flexibility as we can within this process, that'd be ideal. Um, I think everyone, your students included, would really be quite thankful for that. So uh, if you go back into any quiz or any assignment or discussion board for that matter, one of the things that we have when we start to edit the properties of this Canvas item is the ability down below to add a custom assign to field. So for your example, if you had a student that was, you know, heaven forbid, ill or was unexpectedly called to work and was an, unable to take the exam mm -hmm. in this window, you certainly could give them their own custom assigned to. You could even do it on course sections as well. I don't have any students loaded into my little sandbox course, but you know, if I had a student named Mickey Mouse, um, now, whatever, whatever I put for the do and the window of availability is only going to be applied to Mickey Mouse. And, and the other students won't, the other students won't be able to see that. No, yeah, it's just okay. on a per student kind of availability down there. Okay. You know, um, everyone will get this up here because it says everyone. Mm -hmm. But if you have, if Mickey Mouse can't make it, give him or her uh, their own their own window of opportunity. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I'm sorry, on that, if you had more, another student you had to do an individual assignment to, could um, that would refresh itself once you uh, set one up for it. one student, you can go back to a second student and set that up as well. Absolutely, you can have, Okay. You know, individual, I, I don't, I've never run into a limit of how many individual, individualized assigned to features we can add to an assignment or a Canvas quiz. Um, yeah, in theory, you probably could do one for every student if you wanted to. Not a great practice, and I'm not suggesting that at all, but in theory, <laughs> I think the technologies can, will allow for that. And you can also do groups of people. One, that's one of the things I've done. I've had like three or four students get some, you know, I'll, I'll open up the exam for like three or four students. So if you put commas in between all their names, you can provide those students with a, with a larger window. Um, I don't want to hog up the, the time, but I have one more question. I did not know about question banks to um, do that. I went into question groups when I did my, my first exam. Can I filter some of those questions into question banks or do I need to start over? I'm thinking, I'm thinking you probably need, yeah, you probably need to start with a question okay. bank because the okay. whole idea behind the group, the group is kind of like a general category. And if we, mm -hmm. and we can load, we can load questions from our bank into that category. But if the questions live outside of the bank when we create them, getting them into a bank is kind of a hassle. Okay. Um, I think I'm, I, I've seen some people kind of hack it. I mean, you gotta like export the quiz, then re-import just the questions into a question bank, then it'll work. But 
it's there's a couple steps involved um okay. yeah it's not easy let's put it that way oh i didn't know so i have specific uh question groups actually which is a great way to organize the content in the quiz right um, I've done I've done uh, final exams before where I have a question group for like chapter one, right? And here's all the questions for chapter one or, or that are specific mm -hmm. to chapter one. So they, they serve a good fun a function. But if you have multiple choice questions in your question bank, but you don't want to use them as multiple choice questions, can you regroup them into uh, fill in the blank? Um, I think you'd probably have to in that situation, copy and paste the question, create a new question in the bank that is fill in the blank, that is that uses the okay. fill in the blank question type, and then go from there. Okay. Don't know if you can, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just because I have very, I have maybe 10 types of questions on my exams. Right. So they cannot all be multiple choice. Right. That's okay. Yeah, Thank it's you. I uh, making quizzes is tough. <laughs> yeah, it's tough because the first time you make a quiz, there's a lot of labor involved in it, right? It's just it's mm -hmm. a lot of time. Um, but then once it's made, there are tools that allow you to continue to refine and use that quiz going forward. So it pays for itself over the course of a couple semesters. And the auto grading. Is pretty fantastic. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's good. It, you know. Well, thank you, Pat. You're welcome. If there's if there's not any additional questions, I think I'm going to stop the recording right here. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of our of our time today, I'm going to be posting this recording on the CRC DE uh, YouTube channel, as well as the Professional Development Canvas course that the PD office is running. So you'll be able to go back in and review all this information at, uh, at, at your leisure, as they say. So thank you. Uh, and if you have any questions, I wanna put my, my email address in chat. Of course, you're more than welcome to email me as your distance education coordinator at any time. I am here to help, I really am. In addition, please make sure that you use as much as you can the DE drop-in support. That way we can just talk live with me or with Greg at, you know, for as long as you need. It's, uh, we try to make sure that we um, completely solve your questions and solve the problems that you're running as much as we can, right? Um, so it's, we call it, you know, that, that high touch support. Talking with someone's a whole lot better than going through email. So yeah, I may, I may be meeting with you later. Um, I, I, you know, before on that note, and I apologize for interrupting Linda, I'm going to have to take a break from 1.30 to 2.30 this afternoon. Um, I have a little bit of a scheduling mishap that uh, I need to manage. Um, but, you know, after 2.30, I'll be back. So from 1 to 1.30 and then 2.30 to 4.30, I'll be in the room today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Pat. Um, yeah, I, um, some days I get emails, like 30 of them, from DE listing events coming up. Okay. I'm, I'm wondering, that's something I need to figure out how to yeah. get off that list. I, I open up my email and I've gotten like 30 different emails. Um, Are saying, they all coming from Canvas? Uh, they're coming from Distance Ed. Okay. You're, from you're on Canvas. a... I, they're not coming from me. I'm definitely they're coming not sending from out. professional development ah. um, distance ed. Yeah. Okay. The PD crew is different. Okay. <laughs> they right. may be sending out a lot of announcements through their Canvas course, and that's probably what you're getting. Okay. Well, yeah. anyway, I have other issues, so hopefully, I'll be able to get some of those resolved. All right. But thanks so much. This is useful. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. I'm here to help. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you later.